Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Zoom session in which Jao Paolo Miranda Maria is in conversation with Ms. Minakshi Shade. Let me quickly introduce uh, both of them. Jao Paolo Miranda Maria was born in uh, and he graduated in cinema from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he's also a professor at the Methodist Uni University of uh, Piracicaba. Uh, his uh, first uh, short film uh, caught attention, which is titled Command Action, and went on to um, a lot of film festivals across the world. And um, here, Memory House, uh, which is his debut uh, film, uh, is competing at the international competition section of uh, 25th IFFK. Uh, and he's in conversation with Ms. Minakshi Shade. Minakshi is, uh, first of all, she's a great friend of IFFK. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, she's the uh, South Asia consultant uh, to the Berlin Film Festival. And she curates uh, uh, to a lot of uh, film festivals uh, worldwide. Uh, she also contributes to uh, Variety, Screen International, uh, in Back Home in uh, Midday, uh, CNN 18 and several other uh, media houses and online publishing houses. Uh, she regularly writes on cinema and uh, other uh, art uh, related matters and uh, welcome you both to the session and handing over to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bandhu. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here at IFFK. And um, it's, it's been a precious part of my journey for a very long time. And uh, I thank you so much to the audience for joining us um, for the screening of Casa de Antiguidades, Memory House by Jean Paolo Miranda Maria. Thank you so much, Jean Paolo, for joining us. We are very honored to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. <laughs> uh, I should tell you that the Kerala festival audience, uh, film audience actually, is the most cine literate in India. And they are greatly, greatly appreciating cinema at some other level from anyone else in India. So uh, we're very lucky to have them as part of our audience today. Um, uh, I'd just like to add a little more to what Bangu said because um, Jean Paolo's achievements are incredible for someone so young. He's still in his 30s, he's 39, and every one of his four films has been either at Cannes or the Venice Film Festivals. This is an incredible achievement. So for example, his first film, Command Action, which he produced and directed, was at the Cannes Film Festival in the Critics Week. And his next short film, The Girl Who Danced with the Devil, was also in the Cannes Festival's official competition and got a special mention of the jury, 2016. Ant Killers, his third shot, was at the Venice Film Festival 2017. And now the film you just saw, Memory House, his debut feature, was back in the Khan official selection last year, 2020, even in the corona year that the festival didn't happen. And it was also the Toronto and San Sebastian Festival. So he's like all guns blazing. So thank you, Jean Paolo, again for joining us. Oh, uh, thanks so much. So I found it really, really fascinating, disturbing, intriguing film. Um, in India, it's not, uh, it's not easy for us to access films from Brazil. So it's hugely to the credit of the Kerala Film Festival to value films from your country and from your continent. Um, we, of course, have very similar issues here with indigenous people, black people, brown people being marginalized, being oppressed and really being trampled upon. Uh, this is common in many cultures. But your, what you described was something very specific, something that we have not seen. What I liked is that in one of your interviews, you described your role as a director, as a shaman who is kind of exorcising the spirits from the indigenous Black people represented in the film by Christopher, uh, who's of course oppressed by the white Austrian dairy community in southern Brazil where he has moved. And this is a completely fascinating connection to make. Uh, what was it that started you off on this journey where you saw your role, something like a shaman? Oh, for me, uh, this to make a cinema, it's something spiritual. So even when I remember uh, the phrase from Robert Bresson, uh, who said that the director is the one who brings the invisible to visible, so for me to, to make cinema, it's to talk about one another dimension, something so subjective, another dimension. So it's so important to me to imagine like a religion's mission. So I see myself uh, sometimes like a priest, sometimes as a shaman, 
I, uh, I, I'm not uh, particular in, uh, in one kind of religion. Uh, my family is more Catholic, but uh, to say the truth, I am more shamanic. So, so I was introduced in 2018 with uh, one group of in the Indian community during all the year in different kind of rituals. So I consider myself more shaman, more shaman, shamanist than a Catholic one. So fascinating, so fascinating. I mean, this is um, cinema in its purest way. It is actually close to a religion almost, right? That's, that's a fantastic thing to make. I think what, what I found really interesting is that, I mean, to me, there are really very deep connections to this film also to India. Maybe it's in my head. But for example, in Italy, of all the countries, there's a huge community from the northern, from northern India, from Punjab, who are primarily an agricultural community and dairy community. And some of the best mozzarella in the world from Italy is made by Punjabi farmers in Italy. It's really, <laughs> so this, this connection of uh, brown people, black people being used by white dairy community of other cultures is, uh, uh, it's uh, much deeper than one might seem on the surface. And what I found really interesting about the use of the, the dairy culture and the cow, the cow's horns and the cow's uh, mask that he wears in the end, that Krishavam wears in the end, uh, you know, tending more to this animistic, shamanistic um, religion that you describe. Uh, what I found really interesting is uh, Christopher doesn't seem to, he of course is fairly rooted, but he kind of discovers his roots more and more through different objects in the house in the course of the film. And also how in contrast, the, the Austrian dairy farmers who own the dairy factory, essentially in the factory, they only you only see the cows as the others, machines that extract milk, some, something, an object from which you extract milk. It could have been iron or it could have been, I don't know, oil, petrochemicals. So this kind of machine-like uh, way of treating uh, living being uh, was very starkly put. Can you tell us a little more about the symbolism of the cow and what it might mean in the film, but also beyond the film in Brazil? Okay, so of course uh, in Brazil we have this uh, position of the more poor or more simple people from African descendants or indigenous descendants who came from the north and they try to go to the south, the more rich part with the biggest industry and companies and trying to find a better life. But in the opposite, they are being used like machines. So of course we have this uh, re relationship. And of course uh, the opposite culture because the south uh, is more like uh, European colonial, European descendants, more white, so it's very different from the North. So, and now in the pos political moment in Brazil, so we are seeing the, this kind of opposite, the two, the two sides, the poor ones from the North uh, and the South uh, more conservative, uh, right wing way to, to, to political way too. And uh, of course we have the religions too. So, of, uh, so to be connected more with the African, descendants, African uh, culture, descendants, and of course the indigenous ones. So we have one mixed figure that we call, it's called Caboclo Boyadero. It's a figure mixed in, with the Indian, the man, and the animal, the, uh, the ox, the cow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this mixing entity. Oh, sorry, a, sorry. D did you mean it's a mixture of human beings and an ox? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we okay. have this entity. Okay. So uh, in the religions in Brazil, in Brazilian religions, popular religions. So they this entity represents one kind of revolution. So when you listen the song that it's saying, it's time, and it's to time to pray. It's a religion's music I used the, in, inside the temples to the people be in transit to be uh, receive this entity and dance and move in a different way. So that's why, so this music came to the film in this moment to really wake up and to, have, uh, to make one revolution, to clean, to clean something clean and, and it's the death of the old and the more born of the young. 
So and uh, so it's very uh, a, a figure, a symbol so important to to the film and uh, behind the film too. That's extraordinary because uh, in India we have that. Um, we do have figures like um, you know like a half man, half cow. The more popular would be say a god like Ganesha who is half elephant, half human being. So it's very common. We have in Persian cultures like this winged beast, you know, half bird, half yeah. in Egyptian hieroglyphs, you see half animal, half man. So it's common in many cultures. But this, this figure that you spoke about, is that commonly known in Brazil? And it's just, I mean, it's, it's not something in your film only. It's part of the culture, this figure? Yeah, sure. Yes, it's real. This figure, as I said, came from the culture, from the religions, people from... Uh, the Indian and the African descendants. So it's very strong uh, and it's more popular because the rich ones are more Catholic, but the popular ones uh, knows very well the power of this entity, because as I said, it's a revolution. Yeah. So of course, to me, it was so important to use it and not uh, only the symbol itself, but the, to bring the real document of the music, because the music yes. that you listen, it's not something that we elaborated uh, like a fiction to the film. It's, uh, it's something that uh, it's real, a document. It's one song real composed and performance in the 70s to okay. people inside the temple, the church. Okay. So, of course, in a, in a cinema theater that sometimes to me it looks like a temple, to other dimensions. So if you listen so well and you will feel some vibration to, to really who knows, bring this entity. I did. It was kind of quite entrant. I mean, you know, kind of sending you in a trance a little bit. It's kind of quite hypnotic in its rhythm. So uh, it completely fulfilled its purpose, I have to say. It was very, very well used and appropriately. And I was also wondering um, whether your film um, so first of all, I, I'm just very intrigued by the character of Christovam and the whole thing. He's, so of course he's deeply oppressed, but what I really like about your screenplay is that it's too sophisticated to be black and white. And of course it also makes out that apart from him being the victim, he's also an oppressor in his own way. He's also patriarchal. He's also very moralistic and he kind of bullies this other black indigenous woman who's come from the North and tells you, your daughter should be not going out with these men, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's really an interesting layer. Um, uh, would you like to tell us in the screenplay, what, what was it for you important to tell us about Christovam's character? What did you want us to go away with? Okay, Christovam, of course the name, it's like Christovam Colombo, the one who uh, discovered the America, but in the, uh, it's very deeply the image of the, the collective of Brazilian. It's not one individual person. It's about a mixed culture in Brazil because Brazil is a very conservative country too. Because the majority of the people looks the image like the picture of the carnival, the tropical paradise, but it's not so freedom like that. We have a lot of conservative and taboos and problems in a conservative society. Uh, so it's one point that I cannot like hide or ignore this reality. So of course, Christophe is one kind of victim in the film, but he, in the same time, he is the one that oppresses the others. So of course, he is this old one who needs to die to some, something young and new born like the woman, like the two women in the films, they are more revolution the, than uh, the Christovo. So yeah. it's a very import, important point in the film. And of course, when another element behind the, the film itself, it's the figure of the actor, because it's the Antonio Pitanga. It's one of the biggest names in Brazilian cinema history. So he had in his body the history of cinema, Brazilian cinema, because uh, he made the first, the debut film of Glauber Rocha, Kaká Diegues. He was the one who played in the film, the only one Brazilian film that won the Palme d'Or. So he's very important. And now he's like a little ignored because it, he's not like the fashion, the beauty, something like the soap opera likes to show. So 
is something like in this old time that I want to bring him back and show something that no one never saw in him before. So this yes. challenge for me was so important. And in a way to me, like in my religions, to start in a very good way, because he start with my first theater film with Antonio Pitanga, it's the same story like Glauber Rocha, for example. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, since he's such an experienced actor with such a body of work, uh, did you still, I, I just find, I just find a lot of stillness in your frames. You're not saying much, you're not showing much. A lot of the film is in pretty much near darkness. And it seems as if whatever little light there was in the next sequence, you'll try and even remove that. Like first there's a naked bulb, then there's only what we call a kerosene lamp, and then not even that. So you seem kind of progressively going into darkness, which of course is one sees is also metaphorical. But um, there's a real stillness and um, uh, I think that's also very demanding of an audience to, to make meaning of that because uh, of course the same audience that is seeing rubbish on television and soap opera shit is also going to be seeing your film. There is an overlap, but uh, there's not a separate box for different audiences. And I find it fantastic your confidence that while giving very minimal information and stillness, you still trust that the audience is intelligent enough to get what get some of what you're saying, right? Um, your, your, your frames are very, very meticulously composed. What, what is in the frame and what little bit you can see in the little bit of light. Can you tell me about uh, this fantastic cinematographer you have, Benjamin Eker Zaretta, sorry, Escher Zaretta, yeah. who did um, a fantastic woman and uh, you know fantastic body of work. Can you tell us a little more about your collaboration with him, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I came to the shooting, of course, I had a lot, a lot of notes of each shot. So I have like pages explaining <laughs> each shot, each image, each sound. So for me, I, 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 I work in this way because for me, it needs to have one justification. Because if I only act in a way like action, reaction, I will go to the obvious sometimes and not so deeply the way that I would like to treat my subject. Mm -hmm. So I would like to go more deeply each time. So for me, of course, uh, I bring to Benjamin, I show it to him every detail. So when we came to the scrutiny or to prepare the shooting, we passed very fast to the location and I said, it's here. And even if the sun is so beautiful looking to that, I, I explain with a lot, a lot of arguments why we need to put in that exactly position. So of course he agreed that a lot with me because he saw a lot of, of arguments behind it. And he helped a lot me to bring uh, these special elements because the shoot is so still and we have a movement so uh, slow and the idea it's the traveling or close or zoom going inside so we are entering or getting out so all the time because it's this transy idea that you are going deeply and deeply inside this hole inside this world and of course all the mise-en-scene all the layers came to the camera and not the camera trying to follow the action so it's the opposite everything came to the role of the camera so it's something so important to me. And uh, one, ex one, one detail so special that Benjamin uh, helped me to achieve was one kind of bright, one light inside the eyes of the people, the characters. Yes, oh, that was uncanny. Please tell us about that. And this is not something uh, like a digital VFX. It's something that real in the shooting. So Ooh. we we make one one thing that Kubrick made for 2001 when he shot the first uh, introduction of the film with the apes and the monkeys uh, and he had one shoot of one jaguar that you can see the light of the eyes. Yeah. It's because the reflection of the light of the projection that he because he shoot in a studio. So yeah. you saw the skies, the clouds. It's everything projected. Yes. And 
And because the iris of the animal so open, look into the camera, we can see the reflection of the blood inside the eyes. Yeah. So what we did in my film, we made one reflection uh, mirror, very special to the actors, cannot see one very specific light that came in inside the iris. And you can see the blood, the, the background of inside the eyes where the image is formed. So it's one way to try to go inside the soul of the character to, to bring this, uh, this soul to, to arise and we can feel something so strong. So of course, Benjamin helped a lot to achieve this technical stuff. And of course, the sound, it's another story too, because we worked with Nicola Becker to make the soundtrack and the final sound. He made the gravity in the United States, all the sounds of the space, the strange sounds. Yeah. And of course, we, I worked with my partner from Brazil, Leo, and we made the very special sounds too. So everything that you can see and listen in the film, it's so special and came is not for free. It's not so, it's something that have a lot of justification behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. This is just so thrilling because those, the, that light in the eyes is so uncanny and it didn't somehow, I didn't know the process, but it didn't look like just one more visual effect, right? It was just, it's kind of psyching you out, makes you, it, it disturbs you to see it, right? It's not just, sure. because we are so used to seeing a thousand horror films that have all this rubbish, right? But this is disturbing in a different way. And um, now I understand the process. It's just amazing the effort you would make to do that because I think it achieves what you wanted. So that's really amazing. Can you tell us, I think also in somewhere else in an interview you had said that you really didn't want too much jazzy movement of the camera, et cetera, it's fairly still. And you had cited one of your inspirations as Yasujira Ozu, who had a lot of mainly still frames, but composed them very differently, uh, with very meticulously, both in terms of the visual, what is in the frame and outside, as well as the sound. Can you give us an example of where you felt this the most in terms of the most difficult, some of the most difficult shots to achieve with stillness? Oh, I think uh, it's like music. It's uh, like uh, conduce, uh, directing one kind of big orchestra with a lot of musicians. So, so when we make uh, one very simple shot, like minimalist way, of course, we, we need to deal with a lot of elements that needs to bring to layer by layer, move by move, ver, uh, each action. So it's something so precise and mathematical. So of course, it's so difficult. Each shot, it's very difficult to achieve. But uh, I think that maybe the, 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 the first one that when we saw the opening of the film because it's everything white and then you go in one mood uh, that uh, like science fiction uh, mood that we cannot uh, uh, understand where we are and then in the final you see this kind of astronaut someone with this uh, white costume and then you go you see the the, the black uh, mirror but you cannot see the, the face of this one. And then he looks to the hand. So it's something so simple, so simple. And of course, when we cut, we see that strange hole, like one hole in the space. So we are going to find his origin, his story, what is behind the, the layer of the, 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 the clothes. So where is his skin? Where is his story? The marks mm -hmm. of his own time. So mm -hmm. a lot of ideas that I know that sometimes it's not so easily to people take this but it's something that we can feel it's more feeling than understand wonderful wonderful uh, the one I think one of the last questions I wanted to ask you I found it really interesting especially because you just described that one of the central ideas of the film is the death of the old and the rebirth of the new and the young and a lot of the young characters in your film are incredibly cruel, which of course a lot of young boys are, but uh, not just even hitting a stone at someone which is already awful, but just very casual, you know, shooting, killing. It's like, oh, you, like you are playing marbles, you just shoot somebody with a gun. And it comments a lot to me also on the gun culture and what are we bringing, what values are we bringing up our young with? It's so casual and 
even when adults are around, they don't say anything because that's what they expect them to do. Can you tell us a little more about the, the, the young people being so violent? Okay, sure. Oh, everything in the film, it's, uh, it's a real, it's all some, sometimes it looks like folklore or exotic, but it's very real, everything. And this culture of uh, the violence, it's, it's something that came from the government of today. So it's something that came very strong today. So the new generations now, like uh, it's a looking the example of the president that loves so much the guns and wants that everybody use one gun in home. And so, and he speaks so violently too. And so, uh, the violence is in the mood. It's the example for the next generation. So when I am dealing and speaking and thinking about the new generation, how we can make the gen new generation change something? Because uh, we can see the trouble, the problems increasing more and more because this political position in Brazil. So of course, it's something political too. But uh, we can, of course, uh, compare of, about all the history, the way that these poor North people, are, uh, they were treated in our, our history. Because uh, in Brazil, we live in a very conservative uh, uh, society. But it's not only today. Today, they are showing their face. But before, they, they existed. So it's not something that arises only today. But yesterday, they tried to hide. It's something so between the lines. The violence was, uh, was in the way to speak, to treat, to, to the prejudice. So a lot of single and between the lines details. I, um, I think last quick question. Um, so would you, uh, your films have been at festivals worldwide. Has this one been released in Brazil? And would you be concerned about the response from Bolsonaro, or it seems fairly political uh, also that you said so, but also is it in any way relatively safe because it's an art house film and not a mainstream film with you know, <laughs> Schwarzenegger gun kind of macho mainstream stuff. Uh, is there safety in being an art, uh, art house film or uh, if, if and when it's released or it has been released, uh, would you be concerned about the response of the government? So until now, because all the pandemia, we are waiting the opportunity to launch the film in a better way. Of course, we would like to have this first window in the theaters. Yeah. So we are now waiting one better moment. So maybe more in the second semester, maybe it's one idea, but we are waiting. And uh, the point by the, the political point, uh, they, they are now putting one kind of big target in all the artistic community. So it's not only me or the film, but everybody in the culture, they are, they are really putting one target and they are cutting everything. So now we, have, we are pa passing one very bad moment because the Ancine, our agents of cinema, uh, it's dealing with a lot of problems. So they are almost uh, stopped it's like closed so a lot of projects it's stopped so we cannot uh, continue our projects in brazil so it's more like economic way that the, the the bolsonaro government they are trying to really close and put one stop in the artists so i don't see that maybe he or his government will be someone that will try to stop the launch of the film. I think they are not uh, thinking about in this way. So the film, of course, uh, will screen in theaters normally, but, uh, but of course, uh, it's one kind of flag of one future revolution too. So yeah. to, to, to me, it's uh, very important, the social issues too, and political issues. So I cannot only treat art for, uh, by art. So, of course, uh, we are making art, but uh, we are trying to, to make this dreaming happening. The dreaming to change something in our society. And mm -hmm. exclusive in this moment, in this uh, worldwide moment that 
we are passing for for this greatest uh, crisis so of course we need to think about how will be the world of tomorrow how we can uh, build something better in a lot of different ways absolutely so uh, i wish you every success jean paulo it's been a pleasure talking to you and long live the revolution <laughs> no thank you thank you so much thank you so i hope much. you get a chance to look at kerala it's one of my most favorite places on the planet so yeah. after the screening do enjoy yourself thank you so much and thank you again to the kerala festival thank you jean paulo